Ye soldiers of Maine, your bright weapons prepare. On your frontiers arising, the clouds of grim war. Your country's invaded, invaded the soil that your fathers have purchased with life, blood, and toil, with life, blood, and toil. Then hail the British, does anyone cry? Move not the old landmarks, the settlers reply. Move not the old landmarks, the scriptures enjoin. For the sons of Columbia are west of the line, are west of the line. In 1839, Maine came to the brink of war with Canada. Through peaceful debate and diplomacy, the aroostook conflict was averted, and the legacy of this peaceful outcome helped lead America and the United Kingdom towards their modern special relationship, pushed Canada towards independence, and led the aroostook region to develop a folk psyche around the conflict. To see how this dramatic story plays out, we must turn to the beginning. The American Revolution came to a stunning halt at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. With the British thoroughly defeated in the colonies, the newly formed United States of America made peace with its former motherland, signing the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Unfortunately, the maps used to determine the northern border of the United States were inaccurate. The land had never actually been surveyed. Eleven years later, Britain and America signed Jay's Treaty in 1794, an attempt to resolve this along with other points of friction between the two nations. While conflict was evaded for the time being, the territory was still largely unsurveyed and contested. The War of 1812 brought this issue to light. With America attacked by the British and its capital city raided, many Americans became defensive of the borders. Despite little fighting in the area, Britain consistently used the Grand Communications Route, the only route available to connect the key Canadian cities of Halifax and Quebec during the winter, and a route that ran directly through the contested territory. This combined with increasing settlements into the wild lands led to tensions between the Canadian and American settlers. The Treaty of Ghent in 1815 brought the war to an end, however, solved nothing in regards to the northern border. Massachusetts, the territory of Maine, and Canada all attempted to exploit the confusion at the end of the war for their own gain. When Maine became a state in 1820, the wild lands were to be split between Maine and Massachusetts. Maine was determined to gain as much land as possible, making this its position for all debate in the future. With Maine's statehood, the line between it and New Brunswick was supposed to be absolute, causing chaos in the region as there was still considerable confusion about where the actual line lay. The British were overall content with their holdings at the time as they retained control of the Grand Communications Route but Maine wanted to assert dominance in as much territory as possible, primarily for its lumber resources, a resource that all parties had an interest in. All sides wanted to control the timber industry in the region. Maine and Massachusetts both tried to enforce their jurisdiction in the area, selling licenses and land deeds. Despite this, Canadian settlers continued to flock the area, bringing with them a desire for British jurisdiction, as they believed the land belonged to Britain. After a series of American protests, Britain sent agent James A. McLaughlin to investigate. He concluded that the Americans were illegally cutting timber with indirect permission from Maine and Massachusetts, and he threatened people with arrest or fines if they continued their activities. In 1830, Maine, Massachusetts, and Canada all agreed to resolve the issue by reconciling the terms of the Treaty of Paris with the actual geography of the region. Cartographers were so confused by the terms of the treaty and the geography that they arbitrarily defined a new line, which Maine promptly rejected. This left the issue unresolved going into the 1830s. Small disputes continued to occur throughout the 1830s, but in November of 1838, a rebellion broke out in the region. American hunters attacked towns in Canada, but were defeated at the Battle of Windmill, which took place between November 12th and November 13th. 16th, 1838. This would be some of the most violent conflict to take place in the region. Debate in the U.S. Congress about going to war was fierce. Maine was hell-bent on going to war, while many other states were hesitant. They relied on trade with Britain considerably. 
This cartoon shows that some in Britain desperately wanted to go to war to flex their newfound military hegemony after the Battle of Waterloo, as evidenced by the Duke of Wellington depicted here as a dog. Both Victoria and Van Buren are voicing their doubts about going to war, while the main governor, Fairfield, is depicted as a stubborn ox who wants to fight. A Virginian senator is pulling his tail, trying to make sure that peace prevails. While debate raged in America and Britain in early 1839, Maine decided to forge ahead and send a posse of volunteer militia to arrest Canadian lumbermen in the region. The approximately 200 men posse set up camp at the junction of St. Croix Stream and the Aroostook River and confiscated lumber equipment and arrested New Brunswick lumbermen. In response, the New Brunswickers formed their own posse and arrested Rufus McIntyre, Maine's land agent, in the dead of night. Unable to act on the arrest of McIntyre until word was received from London, New Brunswick's leader, Sir John Harvey, sent his own military commander to order the Maine militia to leave. They refused and arrested the commander. After debating the merits of civil interference for months, in March of 1839, the U.S. Congress finally authorized an armed posse led by William Parrott, replacing the Maine militia. Despite this militarization, with both sides increasing their capacity for war, no large-scale conflict actually occurred. The war remained a stalemate as both sides wanted to peacefully settle the situation. To successfully resolve the conflict, America sent Daniel Webster to debate with Alexander Baring, first Baron of Ashburton. Both Webster and Ashburton found sources that reinforced their country's position. Webster found a map in the Paris archives, placed there by Ben Franklin during the negotiations for the Treaty of Paris, that clearly showed the original line giving more land to the United States. In contrast, Ashburton found Mitchell's map, a map from the 1790s that showed England should control larger amounts of the disputed territory. Both sides decided to reject these findings, placing more importance on amicable relations than arguing their positions. Because of this, the debate was able to continue on without interference. Together, they finalized the terms of the webster ashburton Treaty of 1842. The treaty was finally accepted by both the United States and the United Kingdom, including Maine, Massachusetts, and New Brunswick. Though the United States government had a hard time with Maine and Massachusetts finally agreeing to pay both states $150,000 for the loss of their land, the terms of the treaty ceded 7,015 square miles of the territory to the United States and 5,012 miles to the British, and the British managed to retain the Grand Communications Route. The legacy of the Aroostook War and the webster ashburton Treaty goes deep. The peaceful outcome of the conflict set a precedent for future friendly relations between America and the United Kingdom, eventually leading to the modern special relationship between the two countries. In addition, Maine was now a truly established state. Not only was its border conflicts between both Canada and Massachusetts quelled, but it also developed a folk psyche around the conflict and Maine's Maine. independence, right with songs and stories written about the conflict. On your frontiers arising, the clouds of grim Despite these positive resolutions, some Canadians viewed the ceding of the Northern Territories to Maine as betrayal by London, and this dissatisfaction partially led to the desire for Canadian independence in the years to follow. Beyond these important, wide-ranging impacts of the war, the war struck a chord in individuals and their families as well. An example of this is the story of James Buerton Ricketts and his daughter. Ricketts was an artillery leader attached to the military posse sent by the U.S. Congress, and as recorded by his descendants, his daughter, Mary Buerton Ricketts, was born in Aroostook County during the conflict. After receiving help with the childbirth from local Aroostook natives, the baby was christened Aristine, meaning Beautiful River, and the female derivative of the name Aroostook. While her name was later changed to Mary when her father returned from the conflict, she always referred to herself as Aristine, even passing the name down to her children. After five generations, the name is still passed down to Ricketts' descendants. The fifth Aristine is 15 and goes to school in central Pennsylvania. The first Aristine's grandmother, Josephine Laframboise, was half American Indian from the Ottawa tribe. She married Benjamin Pierce, the older brother of Franklin Pierce, and family lore has it that because of this union, Pierce guided the government towards a more sensitive approach to Indian affairs. The legacy of peaceful debate is not the only good to have come from the conflict. The individuals involved found important ways to pass down the legacy of the war and preserve its history.